morning. Thanks everyone for joining us for um, this panel discussion and gallery talk about the Mushroom Bear Project uh, Seeing Through Space exhibition. We are joined today amazingly by four of the six artists whose work is in this exhibition who responded to a call to deal with the concept or the form or the history or any kind of response whatsoever to the mushroom bear as an object. Um, and this is what we have here. So um, it's a pretty amazing uh, display of um, conversations and impressions and responses. And we are gathered here today to hear from the artists directly what they were thinking and um, how, how we all got here to this moment. Um, and by the way, I was reminded yesterday that this is the International Women's History Month, so it's pretty auspicious um, that we have an exhibition responding to women's voices in and across the Islamic world. So that's pretty great and unplanned. Absolutely unplanned. Totally um, planned. It was planned. Yeah, I know yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I had it all mapped out. Um, my name is Nara Wilke, for those of you who don't know me, I'm the director of the Museum of Art and Wood, and um, also the curator of this exhibition, which looks at the Mashorea, um, which is an architectural form um, that's an essential component of Islamic architecture um, that has ancient roots and, um, and also very, very contemporary um, ramifications for artists, writers, thinkers, um, and uh, people who live in and among um, urban and um, architecture. And so with that, I'm going to hand it to um, the artists who are going to introduce themselves briefly, and then we will go back to one by one, um, talking about their work, and um, then we'll leave time for questions as well. So I'm going to hand it to Odatawa Kuala first. Hi. Oh, it's very loud. Good morning. Um, my name is Hora Talako, and I, uh, I'm French and Egyptian. I work in Hamburg, Germany. And uh, I did both works, the Mashtabeya here behind us, and the uh, fabric sculpture. And I will tell you more about it after my colleagues. Hi, um, good morning, everybody. My name is Anila Kuyamaka. And I am originally from Pakistan, um, have been in the U.S. for about 23 years. My work is in that room. Uh, it's called uh, Char Gold, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much. Good morning. My name is Nadia Kapilinka. Um, my father is Tunisian. My mom is Ukrainian. I lived for many years now in Germany, um, and I'm equally thrilled to be here. Bonjour, uh, my name is Majida Khatabi. I'm a French and Moroccan artist. I live in Paris. I work between Paris and Casablanca. I've got my own. <laughs> um, before we, before I hand it back to Olga to talk about her work, um, I do want to mention two artists who are not with us today um, who couldn't join us, and maybe they'll come later on in the exhibition. The exhibition continues until the end of July, so there's opportunity there, and we're going to have a lot of visitors coming throughout the six month period um, to help us think more deeply about this object and what it means. Um, first, I want to point out um, Nida Badwan, who is originally from um, Gaza in Palestine. Um, and now lives in San Marino, um, which is a separate entity of Italy. Um, these works, uh, we had a lot of challenges with shipping, um, continue our challenges with shipping for this exhibition, just a little bit of curatorial transparency. Um, and Nida's works are still somewhere between here and Italy. Uh, so, however, we were able to um, bring her into the exhibition of the images that she created. Um, for the project, and um, eventually her works will be here, um, and we will have we will be able to remove the provisional pieces and install the actual pieces. But this is this is an S. this is her story, um, and I encourage you all to engage with it a little deeply while you're here. 
Also behind you, you have work by Susan Akuna, who is um, born in Cairo, uh, lives now in Berlin, and has um, navigated between those two countries, uh, Germany and Egypt, uh, for her entire life. And um, her work uh, since 1998, she's been dealing with the mushroom in some way or another in, in parts of her work. And what we have here is from Cairo 22. She's been doing one mushroom inspired piece um, over the last 25 years. And this is the work that she did for our show. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it back to the artists who are actually here in the room with us. So we'll have to take it away. Thank you. Um, so I'll get back to the two works that, I, uh, that I'm showing here. The first one is uh, this mashlabeya made of uh, trellises. Um, so in general, I've been working on mashlabeya since um, many years and in different uh, materials, in paper, cardboard, uh, but also in, of course, in wood and uh, in hair. Uh, so this structure uh, is also always interesting to me because it has something uh, we can see through, but at the same time, it is a barrier, so it has something uh, ambivalent about it. Um, and um, in my work, I also work a lot with uh, on the body of a woman, on femininity, and um, uh, and the gaze, which is very much linked. Uh, and um, and that's why it's also the relationship with the mashlabeya is uh, linked to the to the feminine. And in this uh, work, I used uh, trellises from uh, gardening, uh, which is very much used in Europe. I think also in the States, it's used to uh, separate uh, two spaces from one another, but also it is used to control um, the growth of plants or the direction how plants go. So it has something uh, playful, but at the same time, very much controlling and strict. Um, and um, this is, for me, the, the mashlabeya has, uh, has also this component of controlling, of hiding. On, on, on the one hand, uh, the, the use of it in, in the past was to have women behind the mashlabeya looking outside. So on, on the one hand, like uh, the confinement, but also uh, the freedom uh, to be protected from, from the gates of other people and more particularly from the gates of men. Um, so this, these are the, the things that are interesting in this uh, type of work. Then I will continue with the other uh, work which is a soft sculpture made of fabric and it's called uh, Lure. And um, in, in this work I am uh, referencing to the um, to falconry hunting, which is a very male dominated um, I cannot say sport, activity. Um, and uh, the, the falconer uh, uses several uh, objects or several tools to, to train his uh, falcon. And uh, one of them, for example, is the falconry hat, which is small like this. Put it on the on the head of the falcon, and the beak is coming out of, of the hole. So his eyes are shut, and he's calmed down. His instincts are also controlled. Um, and I did these works in, in human size. And uh, another piece of equipment that the falconer uses is um, the lure, which is four falcons, furry, feathery, so like a little animal. So this this side, the side of my hand, and he the, the falconer throws. Um, uh, the roar and gets it back and the falcon jumps and comes back. So it is, he's training the falcon to hunt, but he's also controlling his instincts. So there is always this game also between uh, wildness and, and control, seduction, uh, desire um, that is uh, in this work. And uh, in, in this case, my lure is uh, neither furry nor feathery, but it's round and it's, uh, there are evoking shapes that, that can go in many directions. So Nadia said uh, before it could be also masculine somehow, and uh, so it's a, it's a mix of a sexualized object or an attractive 
object that, that, that awakens certain instincts. Thank you so much, Ola. Um, and then, yeah, even though we weren't in the, alpha, the reverse alphabet order. Right. Well, it's like you said the wrong way. So, um, my, uh, gen my work that I'm known for is very different from this project that I built for this show. Um, I, I like to deal with contradictions in my work um, that connect to our social condition as human beings living on Earth and um, how we have um, so, like, how can we contemplate on the borders, on the ideas of differences and commonalities? And uh, when I was thinking for this project, uh, I wanted to sort of like highlight the concerns that I have been dealing with in my other work, which is very inviting and brings people into a space that is often very feminine, yet is quite conducive to having a dialogue. This work I thought would be more foreboding because I wanted to highlight uh, issues that are connected and connected to climate change that's going to impact the most vulnerable of our world, animals, fauna, flora, species, and amongst the humans, mostly women and children would be affected first. Um, in my also part of it, part of the dialogue that I wanted to have with people was that um, the colonized world that already suffered so greatly in the past will be at the forefront of dealing with climate change. And so I want people to think about how we can make changes in our own lives to help people and have a more compassionate attitude. And I decided to title it Hot Gold because, um, and the, the paint color is actually metallic, which now they generously provided and painted um, with her staff. Um, I wanted us to think of the resources that we are taking out of the earth and we're using up so fast that it's going to really impact us our, you know, future kids or um, the kids, kids, and we are leaving a really bad legacy. And so I wanted to make this work to kind of evoke some understanding of the magnitude. This is a very small action on my part, and I hope that people would think of some of the words that are written in Urdu, which is my native language, and in English translated to show that we need to avoid many of these things so we can move forward as the human species together rather than be separated by culture, borders, be more compassionate to refugees, be more compassionate to immigrants because they, nobody leaves their home because they want to. I think people leave because they, they have a dire need to leave. And so um, it's got me in it because I'm an immigrant living in this country and uh, navigating a space that was often fraught with political complications. Um, I, I remember when 9 11 happened, um, I suddenly became visible. Before that, I used to be quite anonymous in this country. And so that had a deep impact on my life because um, I couldn't find jobs, I couldn't uh, move forward in my career. And so I think it's very common to many, many people's experiences and compassion should be forefront in our lives to connect with others. So that's what the work is about. Very touchy, difficult to start in a, in a different mood because I got engaged in the story. Oh, we have to move. 
So um, I'll be talking about two pieces. One of them is behind you with transparent glass frame, um, which is called Amina's Tears. And the other one is just um, in front of it, opposite, with some shapes um, growing vertically on the wall. So it's called Shadow of a Shadow of a Shadow, etc. Uh, I will start with Amina's Tears. So when um, Nava invited me to think about the Mashabiya, it was quite a question for me because I'm not used to work uh, with Islamic patterns, but something that is present in my life and work is the urban space. And as I said previously, my father is Tunisian. I also grew up in Tunisia, so it's an Arabic country uh, that is present in North Africa. So we have a great deal of influence from the African culture and Islamic culture and European, etc. The Mashabiya is very present, but it has a very different form from other places. It looks more like what Huda did behind us. Um, so I like the invitation because it, the, this shape of the window is present in my imaginary, in my life, um, but I never gave it more attention. In starting to think about it, I remembered a novel that I read long time ago, which is of Najib Mahfouz, and that's called Cairo Trilogy. I read it when I was very young, I think I was not even 18 years old. And one of the things that had impressed me was the presence of the Mashabiya as a character, actually. Because everything, a lot of events are evolving within one, this one house, where uh, the character Amina, and her husband says, say it, are living. If Arab friends are present, they definitely know the connotation. Because um, in, for us, every time we want to speak about a despotic figure, a man would say, I'm not a say it. <laughs> or I'm not your Amina. Meaning a woman that is, um, has been quite living in oppressive conditions. But the interesting thing, this is also really the talent of Najib Mahfoud, is that you don't have black and white. Amina also has really very deep moments of connection to the house, to the place, to the people, to her family. She's very loved and she gives so much love. So there's no moment actually in the book from what I remember where I was pitying her. Although she is playing the role of this woman who never leaves her home. So the only way for her to discover the outside world is from the talking, from her children, her husband, and of course through the rearing of, the, of this window. So yeah, I remember that novel and I decided to make a work about that. And the piece is called Amina's Tears. So um, what you see is a, a glasses, plexiglass panels. If you take a distance, you almost see nothing. It's like just framed glasses. But when you come closer, you have the feeling as if there is like a watery something liquid, transparent liquid. And I really wanted to make this parallel with the, with the tears. So I'll be very technical and tell you how I did. Uh, I used a transparent varnish that could really get fixed on the plexiglass. It's not easy because it's a very um, a surface that is plain, so nothing can get on it. Anyways, and it was painted, so I took pictures from a palace in Cairo and reproduced one-to-one. -one. The Mashabin is there, so we see some panels, they have shapes that are already uh, like almost um, rounded round because of time, it's a very old palace, and others were replaced when we have new. So according to the shape of the Mashabin, you can also read the time. And this is something very present in my work. I am always fascinated to understand our present time through the shapes and how time shapes through the forms, to understand who we are, what we do, our presence through the prism of the past. So that's also in a very discreet, discreet way you can find it. So this work has a melancholic view on it, but there is also a lot of beauty in it. So in my work, or in the way I understand the world, it's never black or white. And I feel like within the deepest moments of our sadness, there's a possibility to find light and to learn something. And as I was telling Nava yesterday, there is no shadow without light, and no light without shadow. They go always in pair. 
in the physical realm, but also in the spiritual one, hopefully. And this work is like a little bit of that, uh, talking about that. The other one, which is called Shadow of Shadow of Shadow, etc., uh, is literally a shadow of a shadow. So I will be more speaking about the process and then maybe we'll try to understand the meaning. Um, here I took a typical kind of Islamic window with a form of sacred geometry, which is sacred geometry that you would find in mosques very often or in public spaces um, all across the Islamic world. So I, I guess in Pakistan you can find this guy as in Egypt or in Tunisia because Masrabi is more specific to North Africa or, to, uh, or Egypt. This is a different kind of Islamic window which has the same effect, it means that you can see through. And what is interesting about the, this kind of windows is that they are present usually in countries that are very hot. And in northern countries, people really seek the sun, versus in North Africa or Egypt or Pakistan, I guess it's more about hiding from the sun. So you filter the sun through the shadow, and that's why you have these amazing patterns of the shadow that gets into the house. And so I worked on the shadow in this case. So what I literally did is to produce this first window, and then I let the sun cast the first shadow, and then I reproduced it, as you see, the second one. And then that second one has produced another shadow. And that third one, I carved it again and produced a third shadow. So it's really literally, it's not what people might think that it's the same object with the sun casting at different moments of time. No, it's literally the same time with this the object that has been, the shadow that has been reproduced. So that my idea was to dilute the form until we go from a concrete, abstract, geometric strict shapes into something diluted, more like abstract expression. That was my idea. And what happened was very surprising. So what happened is that we started from the Islamic window and we that ended with a Gothic window, a typical Gothic shape what you find in the church. And again, the, the beautiful surprise, or that, let's say the, the magic of life, <laughs> is that I realized that everything is truly always connected. So without me wanting to show that there would never have been a, a Gothic art without the Islamic influence, it's the sun and the shadow who did it. And there would have never been an Islamic window if there wasn't been a uh, Roman culture or Greek or Nabataean culture before. So as we are all linked genetically, actually, we all share genes in different ways. We also share different cultures, and the separation is just an illusion. And this is one of the lessons that the sun taught me. Uh, sorry, I speak French, but my English is not good for to talk about my work. Um, um, Mon travail est sous forme de fenêtre de ma charabilla. Euh, quand Nava m'a invité à participer à, à ce projet de ma charabilla, euh, j'ai tout de suite pensé à mes débuts artistiques. Euh, quand je suis venue à Paris, j'avais commencé à travailler sur les fenêtres. So my work is related to ma charabilla, and when Nava invited me, I'm going to say ah, so it's easy. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I have been already working a lot in the Shabbat since the time I was living in Paris and studying in the art school. Yeah. <laughs> um, alors, uh, quand j'ai commencé le, le, le travail sur les fenêtres, uh, mon professeur m'avait conseillé, uh, depuis après uh, pas mal de dessins, il m'avait dit, ma vida, maintenant tu dois ouvrir la fenêtre et sortir. De, de, de ton monde agréable marocain. <laughs> so when she was studying the art school, her teacher told her, now is the time to open your window and get out in, from, the, from the thing that you know, from the comfortable uh, Moroccan space that you know. Alors, c'est comme ça que j'ai commencé à, à faire un travail de performance et de dialogue avec uh, Euh, les gens sur la situation des femmes dans le monde arabe et musulman. This is how I started working with performance and uh, opening a dialogue and a conversation about the situation of the women 
dans le monde musulman et, et arabe, in the, in the Arab world, in the Muslim world. Et euh, le travail de performance, c'était des défilés de performance que j'ai ensuite transformé en, en travail euh, de photographie euh, en reprenant l'orientalisme, la peinture orientaliste. Le, le travail de performance, euh, ensuite le travail de performance, j'ai commencé à faire des photographies. After the, yeah, the work with the performances, I started doing uh, the work with the photography around the theme of orientalism. Oui, avec toi. Alors, le travail ici, c'est vraiment un, un concentré de performance, de photographie, de, de, de travail de dessin sur les fenêtres, et donc du regard de l'autre. So, uh, here it's a concentrated uh, uh, concentration of the work of performance that I did, of uh, photography and the work of drawing on the windows. Et ce qui était intéressant pour moi ici, c'est de c'est le lien que j'ai créé entre les gens de Philadelphie et mon travail. What was interesting here for me was to create a link between the people living in Philadelphia and my work, my own work. C'est comme ça que je perçois mon travail artistique. C'est un échange sur ma perception du monde et la leur. Et, et suite à ça, on crée l'œuvre. So that's how I understand uh, my artistic uh, process is through the perception of the others and mine, and together we create la forme artistique. The, the, the artistic form. Donc le, le, le plus important, c'était de rencontrer euh, les Beard ladies, les, les gens de, 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 des acteurs, des gens normaux, des citoyens de Philadelphie, où j'ai eu un échange sur la question de la culture euh, musulmane, l'architecture musulmane via le machinabillet. Et c'est comme ça que je perçois euh, le dialogue artistique qui crée des liens entre les gens. So I was very happy to meet the people here, be it like artists, actors, regular citizens, and to open up this conversation about the Islamic world. And um, yeah, this is where I created the, the art through this dialogue. Le fait, le fait d'observer, de, de regarder les, les, les images, les photographies via le machin d'hier, on est obligé de rentrer, de, de, de s'approcher, de s'approcher du tableau, de le regarder, euh, d'essayer de comprendre ce qui se passe, pour moi c'est comme une analyse de la culture de l'autre. Mm. So because of the constraint of the machabea in front of the screen, you are somehow forced to come very close to, uh, to see what is happening. And for her this is a way, she puts the spectator in a situation to analyze the culture of the other. Thank you, everyone. Thank you also, Nadia, for, for providing translation service, I'm sure. <laughs> um, I think um, I want to make sure that everyone here has a chance to ask questions until you have a lot of questions. And also, I want to make sure that you have a chance to walk around, um, because not all of the works are immediately visible um, and encounterable to us as we sit. We have to explore the space um, in order to really engage with them. But um, I did want to throw out a couple of questions while we're sitting here. Um, seems like an opportune moment, and just to be fair, um, I did not share these questions ahead of time with artists here, so please bear that in mind. I'm throwing them out very, quite spontaneously. Um, but I got, when you were speaking about your work and the process behind them, um, it, it, it seemed important to me to um, uh, to share a couple of things with the audience here. And, and first of all, I, I want to uh, let everyone know that none of these artists had ever been here to this space before um, this week, in Magic's case, last week. So, and yet, we have an exhibition that, um, for me, in a very fulfilling way, responds beautifully to the architecture of this space. And for those of you who know the museum, know that we're very proud of our gallery space and what it offers um, artists and visitors alike. It's, it's really beautiful here. Um, so I want to ask artists who are willing to respond to this question um, how it was to think of an architectural object and then 
create a one or two or, or installation based works that really are in dialogue in many ways with the space that we have here without having been here before. Well, um, you know, I often am invited to do shows, um, and sometimes because of the pressure of the work, uh, I'm unable to do site visits. So I have become quite adept at I'm trying to understand this space, although with this particular space, it was slightly deceptive in the sense that I had envisioned it slightly bigger somehow, even though I, I understand the, the, you know, the metric or the, you know, the spatial uh, length and width and depth. But I, I think uh, one thing I must say is that I do appreciate the challenges when I'm dealing with uh, installation-based work because I have to expand and contract with the space itself and this space provided some challenges because it was uh, difficult to light it um, because of the track lighting but we managed really well with your staff and the person who came to do the lights um, but I, I, I often think that artists are or at least I can speak for myself that I, I try to understand the space from photographs as much as possible, but it's always better to visit a space because then the ideas often change as you are thinking things through. And sometimes uh, the challenges are exciting in that sense because uh, it can develop a new work. So when I was here, I had not envisioned the cubes having tails at the bottom, but once I got here, I realized that it's really important for the line to continue all the way to the ground, so you could add more um, cubes to it if you needed to, or you could change the configuration, and the next time I, I envision this project to be displayed, I think I'm going to change it around, and that's the, the other flexibility I appreciate when I'm dealing with space, because I can kind of reconfigure, maybe I'll do a spiral next time, or I'll do an actual pyramid, or you know, like a real cube within cubes. And so I, I think um, I like the fact that spaces often give you challenges that you may not really think about. And as an artist, that makes me grow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, in my case, um, the Mashrabi as I did until now were on the wall, and this space gave me the opportunity to do a Mashrabi that was in the space and that you could see on both sides, or from all sides, <coughs> which is also interesting for the idea of the Mashrabi, which is separating uh, but also connecting at the same time. It is about inside and outside, so all this duality that is in, in, in this object. Um, I wanted to recreate in this space and having it float in the middle of the space and not uh, on the wall this time. So this was the interesting part of, uh, of this gallery, which has very high ceilings and I can put a hand, uh, my trellis is uh, in the space and, and have a new type of work for me to experiment with. Okay. Um, for me, honestly, these two pieces could have been, because they're wall pieces, they're not related absolutely to the space, but there is something very peculiar and really interesting that happened with Shadow of the Shadow of the Shadow, is that um, there was a misunderstanding of the level of the height of the wall. And before I say that, I have to say something about myself. I learned through my experience of working as an artist that very often when we have problems, be it financial, technical, uh, human-wise, whatever, they might be presence, the opportunities to discover something new. 
So instead of resisting, which I used to do before, I just let go and see where it's going to take me. And it has been proven to be very fulfilling actually, very creative, like very positive for an artist to work. So here something similar happened. I go back to the anecdote. There was a misunderstanding on the level of the height of the wall. And it happened, if you see behind there, there's an extension. Um, so we saw at a certain point after the work was produced that it's not fitting in the wall. And Alexandra asked me if there is something to do. Yeah, and so we imagine this extension, and at the end, I actually love it because it adds a very humoristic part to it, as if but because the Gothic window is always going towards the sky, the idea is that the building is bigger than you, God is somewhere very high above. That's like the theory, how we are supposed to feel when we're in Gothic church. And this is as if it really has this extension above our limit on the earth, and it had as if the, the wall grew somehow. So it's something that was not intentional, again, like the shadow that taught me something. The space itself had brought a new dimension. And now even thinking if I show this work again, it would be amazing to have the same situation. But we will adapt it. Who knows where it will go? <laughs> uh, oui. En fait, moi, quand Dava m'a invité à, à l'exposition, uh, Pour moi, ce qui m'intéressait, c'était l'extérieur. <laughs> Je pensais plus à l'extérieur qu'à l'intérieur. So when I invited me uh, to do this exhibition, I was more concentrated on the outer space <laughs> rather than the inner. Uh, Je n'ai pas pensé mon projet en fonction de l'espace ici, mais en fonction des gens, de la rencontre que je vais créer avec les gens. Uh, Je, je ne suis pas une artiste qui reste dans son studio, donc je vais toujours à la recherche de la rencontre. So, for, uh, for me, it was the most important thing is the meeting with the people, what's happening outside these dialogues. I'm not this kind of artist that really sticks to the space, to the inside. Après, je suis sûre quand la rencontre euh, tient, quand elle se produit, la forme artistique, je suis sûre de la forme et je peux l'intégrer. So when the conversation and the dialogue has really took form, I know that the artwork will be good and it will be, I'll be able to implement it in the inner space. Fantastic, thank you. Yes, that was always the conversation between Imagine and myself. Um, and this, so thank you for articulating that so beautifully. Um, I think I'll throw out one more question and then, and then we'll open it up. Um, this, these conversations started very nearly three years ago, which is really impossible for me to believe in a lot of ways. Um, and in that time, if you think about, and I think you mentioned 9-11, and how, what a benchmark that was in terms of um, what it means to be an immigrant in this country, for example, but also the um, precarity of um, Swana identity in this country. Um, that continues for unfortunately 22 years and, and going forward. Um, so when we think about packages of time, we can think about you know our initial conversations which happened two and a half years ago and until today, um, and what has happened in that two and a half year package of time. Um, there have been wars, um, there have been pandemics, there have been um, Terrible things and beautiful things, the light and shadow. Um, could you respond to this question of what what has happened, either personally or more universally, to you over this two and a half year period of time, as the Basharia was in your background? Oui, effectivement, après tout ce qu'a évoqué Nava entre le le premier sa première invitation. Les pays unis, les guerres, tout ce qui s'est passé. Euh, le projet Mashrabi, pour moi en tout cas, c'était encore plus important euh, cette idée de, 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 de créer encore des liens, d'aller encore vers l'extérieur, d'aller chercher la rencontre avec les autres. 
Yeah, so um, for me, from that moment of the first the conversation that I had with Nava and everything that was happening with the wars, with the, uh, the epidemic, etc., it just con consolidated and made it stronger for me the idea that I really need to go outside and create the links and the dialogues. It felt like it's really urgent, the most more important. Et l'idée de, de Mashrabiya, de, de, de ce regard porté à travers euh, cette euh, ouverture ou cette fermeture, parce que c'est quand même comme un obstacle, mais qu'on dépasse avec le regard. So, c'est à dire que Mashrabiya, that is at the same time an opening, but also it is a limitation, and it's the same about the, the dialogue going outside. C'est en fait, c'est l'idée de. Euh, dans ma pièce ici, c'est cette idée de, de, de regarder à travers le filtre, mais de se pencher, de s'approcher le plus possible pour connaître ou découvrir ce qui se passe, donc de connaître l'autre. So the idea in my work is to see through this uh, separation, but it's, this is what invites you to come closer to discover the other. Voilà. Je pense que après tout ce qui s'est passé. On a besoin de créer de plus en plus le lien et la forme artistique le permet mieux que tous les discours sur Terre. Uh, yeah, with all of what happened, I think we really need to create a link and the artistic form is the best way to do it. Uh, This question means I'm trying something actually. So I'm trying to pull it spontaneously <laughs> because, as I said, we're not prepared to it. Um, these last three, three years have been, I think, uh, for me, the deepest in terms of change and transformation, inner change. I can literally say I'm a different person today. And I hope for the best. So it really taught me. To have the courage and the guts to get out of my comfort zone um, and to speak out. And if there is something that I don't like, I will not stay in my position of complaining of the victim. I will start by changing myself. So I took very important decisions in my life and I trusted the process. And I can say that it was very fulfilling. So I'm living a new adventure. Um, and it is an adventure of gathering of community that we will be together, understanding the artists as my closest people. And independently of their color of skin, they can be yellow, black, violet, pink, I don't care, because we're equally exploited everywhere on the planet. We artists don't have any status, contrary to any other worker on this planet or person, adult, who has a job. You either are an entrepreneur, responsible for your own business, or you are an employee. The artist is neither or, or. So it's not accepted that you are an entrepreneur, but you're also not an employee, you're not employed by the gallery. So it is a very um, frustrating situation, but the problem is that the artists today live in a regime of fear. They're afraid if they speak out, they will not be invited. So they're trying to become everybody's darling. And that's very dangerous for art. Because it's also expected from artists to free the world. But if they're not free, how are they supposed to do that? So there's like an inherent contradiction that I don't want to be part of anymore. And the pandemic, and the wars, the catastrophes, catastrophes that have happened, just to remind you about the important things in life. And what's important is that you realize for me that we are strong when we're together. So I understood that I'm not in competition with other artists. They are my friends, they are my colleagues, and we can only raise our voice if we do it together. No curator will free us, no collector will free us, no director of an institution, it's only us. So I didn't speak about the words, but about myself. I really appreciate that, Nadia. I, I think uh, artists and uh, creative people often live in fear quite often. Um, 
but the last three years I think have been different for me because um, somehow I have received a lot of opportunities and it may be because my work is um, inviting people to have dialogues and uh, but I think over the years I have realized how the way we have created the world it has created such a, hypocr a hypocritical hierarchy that um, the unfortunate of the world are often really, really down and people walk over them. And I think it breaks my heart to think of the wars that are going on and uh, I think during the pandemic I would just burst into tears while I was listening to books or, you know, listening to podcasts because so much bad stuff was happening out there. And I think um, it's made me realize that my role doesn't have to be just to make pretty pictures. It's to really make people think and, you know, participate by contributing to um, situations where I can actively help other women artists actively do things by donating artwork so that it can go towards the refugees in, um, in Syria or especially in my own country that has faced dire consequences from the flooding that happened this past year. And I feel that, um, you know, until and unless all of us as the human race unite, there's no way that we can save this planet. And I feel for our future generations. I think that I was reading or listening to NPR some some time back, and uh, this gentleman was talking about how many um, species of trees have already died, and then the bees are dying. And I, I, it just breaks my heart to realize that I am contributing to that by just being human. And so I think I have a great responsibility towards people from my own culture, but also people around me, especially women, and people who are displaced. And so it's made me realize that I have to contribute and strongly. And I think it's my responsibility and I want to do it. It's not just um, thinking of doing it, but wanting to do it. And um, I hope to continue doing that way. I think the pandemic really brought it home to me to realize how the world is changing. And especially the fires in the West of this country. You know, how many people are homeless now and struggling because of the pandemic. Uh, I, I've been very lucky, so I, it's my duty to help others if I can. Um, the pandemic years, or since we talked till, till today, it was from quite a bad year for uh, health-wise or family-wise because, um, for example, my mother passed away because of COVID, so it was a very, very tough uh, time, but on the other hand, also a very, very good one because um, through this, through going uh, very deep down, you, you can bounce back and, and come higher than before, um, if you're lucky. So it was a, a, a process that was, um, at the end, very regenerating and, uh, and positive. So, and uh, that's what I also see in, in the pandemic is that, uh, or things like the pandemic is that when you have something ending, uh, it is the beginning of something new and that's how I uh, try to think uh, about when, when, when there are such events like the pandemic that it is a transformation um, that makes you question a lot of things also review a lot of your uh, of things in your life uh, if, and, and you can readjust and learn and, and develop yourself further 
So this is what it did, uh, it did to me. So it was a, a fall with a rebalancing and a, and a new positive outcome for me personally. We have about 10 minutes. So if you want to do questions. Yeah, I have to um, So uh, thank you all of you for, first of all, being here, sharing this. Um, week with us, two weeks for you, um, and uh, it has been an incredibly profound experience to um, not only engage with you over the last two and a half years, but also share um, space with you uh, this week, um, and I will be digesting that um, for the next, well, at least six months. Um, I want to open it up to people who joined us this morning if you have questions. Um, Rick, first of all, all right. Well, I really think that was a quite a wonderful experience from the point of view of looking at things and then understanding the intimacy of the people that thought those things up. Um, I remember what an extraordinary experience it was for me. Uh, to be in Cordoba and see the Mosque Cathedral, this extraordinary amalgam of Christianity and Islamic thinking. Um, to think about the contrast of that and the Spanish conquistadors in South America whose choice of how to deal with the cultures that they were conquering was to destroy the religions of those places at first and build cathedrals on top of them as to suppress them. And I also thought about the fact, um, which you and I unfortunately don't have the opportunity to do, if we sit here looking through Bashavia at all the activities going on outside here, <laughs> and, and understanding from a real life point of view what actually this experience is that we are talking about here. But the real thing I think is very important here is the business of first resilience, which and you spoke about. And the other is about the nature of communication itself. Um, uh, I mean, uh, we, we talked about this intimacy, but um, your work is about, in a sense, in this exhibition, also about transparency um, and, um, and what we see through it and what we see of ourselves as others see us looking through it. I think that's an important dialogue to have. I mean, the role of artists has always been exactly the role you were talking about. And it isn't a measure of success necessarily. Um, I mean, it is, it is important to measure success in the things that we think about. It's important to keep doing them, to never surrender to the possibilities that this is the only thing. Always means something, and the you know the one experience that I have of that kind of personal intimacy was an experience that I had maybe 25 years ago when I had the opportunity to be in the chamber of the Al Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, and the light that suffused that space um, gave it a kind of um, mobility. And, and uh, quietness because of Walter Hart's on the floor. And there was an older woman reading a copy of the Quran, leaning against one of the eight pillars that supported that dome. And she was in a perfect state of repose. And I looked at her hands, they were the hands of a working person. Um, and that intimacy of thought and contemplation was so much a part of the absence of today's world of busy, 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 busy. And I think it's important for an exhibition like this to talk about that kind of intimacy and that kind of personal information. The idea that we could have the opportunity to actually speak to and listen to artists, tell their dreams and their aspirations and their difficulties and their challenges is an unfortunately not an opportunity we have very often. So, it's a welcome opportunity to have you in our city, 
also to um, to share that experience with you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Any of oh. you? Um, wondering about Mashabia and Mashabia is in one end really appealing, and other end is a screen. So it's definitely the original purpose for that was like several purposes, but one of the purpose was a separation between uh, community, female, male, and those kinds. So I'm wondering about you as a female artist. What's your relationship to Mashabia? It's, it's, it's blocking female women from being outside of you. See, how do you respond to that? Like, do you want to break it? Do you want to be outside? Or, or like, you, do you like it? Do you like the, do you like the way it's doing that? So I wonder if your relationship to Mashabia For me, the Mashabia is a wonderful piece of architecture, and um, and I certainly don't want to break it. But what I would like to break or to change is how is the patriarchal structures that are behind the Mashabia or whatever else. I mean, here it is Mashabia, but it can be uh, the law against uh, abortion. It can be uh, the pressure of social media. Uh, girls, it can be whatever is there to control um, the woman uh, and their body and their freedom. So it's not the mashabi itself, it's the mentality behind any structure that is rooted in patriarchy. This is it for me. It's not the mashabi as such. Thank you. I second that myself because, you know, um, where I come from, we don't call it the mashrabia, we call it the jali. And I took the jali as an architectural element that I could use for critiquing oppression in any form towards women in the beginning, but then it became larger and more extensive and expansive to deal with bigger issues that allow the patriarchy to continue to be imposed on other people. And patriarchy can be considered ways of controlling people that may not want to be controlled. So women, of course, especially, half the world is, you know, female, and yet half the world, or maybe at least much of the world, is illiterate or kept like that. Contraception is not allowed to women um, in parts of the world. Um, abortion is illegal in much of the world. And it, you know, biology makes women unable to take on the world. I often hear people say to me, men especially, that that's why we rule the world. And I think, but if you let us rule the world, we may do a better job. We may save the world. <laughs> so I, I agree with Hoda that I use it as an architectural element that you can see through the vision of what could be better. It is, a, um, it is 11.15, just to give you all a fair warning. Thank you for the question, because <clears throat> I think I never asked it myself frontally, but it has been there all the time. Because there is an unease, a feeling of unease that I didn't really look at, but I think it was there. Unease because on the one hand, it's really a beautiful element in the architecture, and we cannot deny patriarchal structure that has produced it. But again, these are the beautiful contradictions of life. Exactly. Within the horror, you can learn lessons, you can transform, you can become someone else, 
You don't do it while you're drinking cocktail in the swimming pool. <laughs> Maybe, but it happens, unfortunately, usually through tough experiences. Um, but there is definitely an unease that I didn't look at. But now that I'm looking at my work through the prism of your question, I think my work answered. So one was to not break the mashadiyya, but make it less harmful, so transparent. It cannot cage me anymore. I can see through it. Meaning I can also control it. I'm really answering as like now, because we want to look into that question. And the other one is bending it. I didn't break it, but I made something else out of it. Again, so that I'm not controlled by it. Neither do I control it, but it's something manageable. I can work with it. Uh, for me, the, the mashallah is a symbol of power. For me, the mashallah is a symbol of power. The the women had. Quand j'allais chez ma grand-mère, à Meknes, dans L'Oréal, il y a des fenêtres pour le machabi. Quand j'allais, when I used to go to my grandmother's house in Meknes, the house has also had these machabi windows. Alors, le pouvoir de regarder sans être vu, de découvrir ce qui se passe et de d'écouter ce qui se passe sans être repéré. The power of looking without being looked at. <laughs> and to hear kind of style. Ça permettait aux enfants d'écouter, de savoir beaucoup de choses. It allowed the children to hear, to see things, many things. Pour moi, ça reste le pouvoir. For me, for her, is power. Thank you. Um, I'm going to leave it here. I have to move. Oh, yeah, one more comment. Yes. Very cool. So I just uh, want to say that uh, I like so much the confrontation between the, the intersection between spaces to be inside and to be outside at the same time through the machine. And thus, you know, I, I can see in many, most of your art. So I just want to mention this. Uh, you know, this to be inside and outside is very important. You know, as, a, as, as a human and also as we engage with what happening around us. You know, like we are involved in everything, but we still hit it. You know, like the uh, So that's important. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, um, Please join us um, and continue for the next six months as we continue to learn. Um, this week we, we got set up on, on a really high note and we're going to keep it going. Um, I do want to thank um, Phil Kramer and Mimi Genosi and Evan Kramer who are here today who are Majida's collaborators and also our neighbors. Um, amazing. It has been amazing to create um, relationships and connections. Apropos um, with uh, people, and this is um, this is one of the opportunities that we, as a staff and as a team, have been looking forward in our little um, space of the world. And so we couldn't be more excited about that. The second thing I want to mention um, is that uh, deeper engagement with each of the artists in this exhibition is happening through virtual talks. Oda and Alina have already um, participated in the same through space talks and you can see their talks on the um, museum's YouTube channel and then as we continue with the exhibition we will also give um, each of the artists in the show that platform um, so please join us for those talks which can be accessed from anywhere in the world um, and I'm going to leave it there thank you so 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 deeply much